palliative care is taking care of people with serious illness, taking care of people during those last several years of life. It's distinct from hospice. Um, and so that's who I am. And what we're really talking about tonight, or why everybody's here, is to, is hip fractures. And of course the goal is to get people better and get them moving on their way. But it doesn't always work quite that perfectly. That is the goal. And there is a small part that it seemed like it was appropriate for me to talk to. Um, but I only have two slides, so it'll be quick. I don't know people here yet because I just joined in the last couple weeks. So how many people are EMTs? Are there any EMTs here? Nobody wants to raise their hand? Paramedics. paramedics, sorry. See, I don't know what to even say or to call you. Two paramedics, great. And then how many people work in the ER? So nurses and doctors, great. And then the only people who didn't raise their hands are the ones I know. That worked out well. <laughs> so hopefully we'll all get to know each other over time. So my slide number one is directed at the paramedics, and my slide number two <laughs> is directed at the ER. And I should have added something more to it, and we'll get to it. So one thing that is always hard for us to capture when somebody comes in, 911, and is suddenly here with a hip fracture is who they are. And I bring this up partly, and as Neil said, I'll talk again at greater length later, because sometimes there's someone who is going to fit into that category of not do great. Hopefully not often, but you all in the household are who see a ton. And you know if that's a kind of a not very good house they're coming from, right? If they're tripping over dogs everywhere, if there's cat poop on the fireplace instead of in a litter box. Um, if, they, if there are a lot of empty Jack Daniel bottles or cheap wine bottles somewhere, all these things that uh, Dr. Adler's gonna talk a little bit more about causes of falls, but you know kind of what the house is and you know whether they're red flags just from that. And I bring this up because pass it on, write it down, tell these guys so that they then can start flagging social services and, and we can try and pull together so that when we get that person up and moving with a beautiful piece of hardware in their hip, um, that maybe they're going to go to some place where they won't fall over again and break the other one right away. Um, are, are there smoking burns everywhere? And I'm sure you could think of other things. The other thing is who lives there? Uh, it got pointed out, a lot of these guys live alone, and you're going to come in, wrapped you open in the line, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, if Mrs. Jones has fallen, and Mrs. Jones is the one who has the intact brain, and you're picking her up because you can see that this is displaced, she may have a lot of other problems, but all she's thinking, really thinking about is going to be Mr. Jones, who's dementing, and is going to wander off, and all the resources. So if you see the trigger that, and this is of course true for the ER too, if, somebody, if the other person in the room clearly can't remember where they are, you know, start thinking, uh-oh. I better make sure that, that Linda's group knows that we need social services, we need palliative care, we're going to have more than just a hip to fix here because there's more going on. Medications and over-the-counters. So Linda will talk more about falls, but one thing that's always a problem when people roll in and we don't know them because they're not cared for easily and it's the middle of the night is what is all this stuff that they were taking? And I know that you all can't walk in and take all their drugs and bring them, but if another person is coming, you can strongly encourage them to put them all in a Ziploc. That'll be great. Because then in the ER, all the nurses and doctors can find out the dose, find out that it was filled six years ago as opposed to three days ago like it was supposed to in the name of the pharmacy and all that extra you know, detective work that helps us with med rec, helps us know that <laughs> There's a reason why they're bleeding, they're on Plavix and aspirin, or they may not be supposed to be, but they're still taking it because they have recent bottles of it. Um, which particular new antiplatelet drug they're on. The beta blockers, of course, are critical because, you know, Mrs. Smith looks pretty good. She's worried about Mr. Smith. Her pulse is 60. Everything seems fine. Oh, wait a minute. Here's Coumadin, Plavix, and Imitoprolol. Well, that's why she's not tachycardic, even though she's so pale, you know? Because we've, we've blocked her down, and so she can't show that she's sick. Hopefully you won't find that, but it's just, it's why we want all that information and how it's helpful. And of course, everybody's taking all their Tylenol PM, 
you know, six or seven of them. Everybody's taking all that other stuff. If you can encourage somebody to just clean out the medicine cabinet and, and bring it in so we can know whether somebody was taking, their, taking Xanax or anything else, it's really helpful. Um, and here, you know, I recently was at a conference and got reminded about teaching. And you would think, I didn't tell you, the last 16 years I've been teaching residents across the street at GBMC. So I, I know absolutely what you're supposed to do. If you give a didactic, we all forget it all very quickly, right? And so what helps the most is if we practice a skill. I'm confident that, so when I wrote my objectives for this, who knows what happened to them? Um, I said that we were going to practice this. <laughs> If you can just remember, say, hey, have you ever got one? Have you got one of those advanced directives? Do you guys do this all the time anyway? Am I really just, you do. But just, it's just, if you could just say it in your sleep, everybody, anybody who gets a family member, do you have an advanced directive? Who's the decision maker? Who talks for you if you can't talk for yourself when you're too sick? And certainly, if they've got a most somewhere, that's so helpful because they've been discharged. Now, I, as a PCP, because I still get to wear a small hat of pcp -dom because I really like my internal medicine practice, which is very geriatric oriented. Um, at all my wellness visits, I do advanced directives and I do MOLSTs. And I give people three copies. I keep one myself for the chart. And I say, give this to your kids. You know, tell everybody what we've talked about. We'll revisit this again either next year or in five years. Right now, you're either very healthy. I think all this advanced stuff is good. You know, with your lung disease, I think our talking about not putting you on a breathing machine is right. But I tell them, stick in your fridge, leave it lying all over. This should not be a secret. I don't, I don't know how many of my patients you'll pick up, hopefully not many. But um, still, they, increasingly, they're going to be mosts in houses. And the thing to do is just to ask. And, so, and finally, if there's another person around, say, hey, um, is Mrs. Smith acting normal? You know, just give us any indication you can of her baseline mental status. Clicker. This one? Oh, sorry. I turned it off. Do you have any canned prevention programs, either in development or that exist currently, that would apply to our environment? Prevention is something we've thought about. And there's some other areas we're going for mention, but this is one that's been talked about with the elderly looking at their living environment and making suggestions. We have a relationship with our health department and a pretty good system with social services that if someone looks like they're an adult in need, that we have different pathways we can go uh, to try to get them county help. Um, so would you have a prevention program that would apply to us? And maybe not today, but looking forward. Um, and also, how, how does your social um, health network work when you bring Mrs. Smith in? Do you actually do home visits and things like that with them? Or is it more education here in the hospital? So I want to meet with you later because you are exactly one of the resources that Neil and I, Neil just ran away, but um, just we're talking we're about too. what we need. <laughs> What, um, you know, what we want to make sure is increasingly in place here is what we do not, from St. Joe's at this point or in the immediate future, have an organization that goes out, and, and Gail, tell me if I'm wrong, but that goes out and does home visits. We use local resources. And we, and there are places in the country where they're beautifully set up palliative care situations where they've managed to line everything up right, where they do help that cycle, you know, that those people, they don't want to be calling 911, but they don't have any other choice, right? They don't have their hip fracture yet. This is more the conversation that um, is supposed to be happening when we're not just talking about hip fracture. But um, I am new enough here that I don't know all the answers and I'm trying to learn them, but no, we don't have a program yet. I would love to have it. I, at this point, we are hospital-based because we're very small right now, but we're going to grow because well, you're talking about what we program need. The program's actually pretty, it's been pretty successful and it's been institutionalized for a number of years, so we think it works pretty well. Um, the prevention program is the thing under development. I don't know that we have the resources to really commit to development of a whole program. If somebody had one, right. you could say, hey, here's things if you walk into a home that you could look for it if you do. Here's information on how you could refer that information to others. Other than the, the, you know, the, the obvious 
you walk in these living conditions are just unfit. Right. Um, but scatter, you know, just things, right. Things, all the the, all the little, little table. Um, so let's let me learn more about what you have, and and so that we can use the system you have too. Because that would be great. And then you tell me what would be helpful to you, and I'll tell Gail, and then we'll get it over time. Yeah, we're definitely wanting to grow this program. So. Yeah, we're in the houses. That's the advantage we have. Right. And, and, no, but, and when you talk to the elderly, um, so nice studies, 75 to 76 percent. Okay, so part of that's cancer studies, uh, but just asking independent living elderly. If a crisis happens, what's the most important thing? This is a nice study, though it's still less than 1,000. But 76% um, say their most important thing is to be independent, to become independent again, to remain independent. The next step down was pain and symptom control. That was less important than being independent. Number three, when they had to pick out of a list, living longer. So people want their independence, they want to be able to maintain it, and if we can figure out good ways to help keep them safe and, the, uh, and independent, that'd be great. Okay, I haven't looked at the time for a few minutes, so now we'll switch over to slide number two, and that is pain control in the frail and or elderly. And the idea of doing ephemeral block, I think is great. Um, I love that. Uh, very briefly, the pathophys, you know, just remember these people have a lot less body fat and a lot less muscle. Their volume of distribution is bigger. Things last longer is what it comes down to. So a long-acting med lasts three times as long. Short-acting lasts longer. Everything does. Everything's gotten older. A creatinine of one in somebody who's 80 is abnormal, right? Their, their kidneys have lived that long. They can't tolerate as much. They won't excrete it as well. They won't process it as well. So this really, really simple thing that I, I'm not a great memorizer, but I, I learned it. It works really well. Start low, go slow. Um, so right now, we're talking about somebody that you're about to admit to the hospital. So we're really just talking about acute pain. At another time, we'll talk about long-term pain. But when you're just thinking about the person you're going to admit to the ER, you're going to admit for their hip fracture, don't use an NSAID, OK? Because these people, it could be that they're going to get VANC. They're going to get some other, they're going to get other medications. They are dry. They, may, they are going to have some renal insufficiency already. And we're going to end up hurting their kidneys. So just don't use it. It doesn't really work that great. If that person hurts when you move them, give them a little IV narcotic. Because um, uh, while you don't want to overload them and have them not be able to get up and move, pain causes delirium just as nicely or more so sometimes than narcotics, as does constipation and a lot of things in the elderly. And of course, lying there on the floor for a couple hours being thirsty, they're going to be delirious very possibly, particularly if they had a little borderline, either mild cognitive impairment or dementia. Delirium on dementia, one of the most common things, uh, probably on Linda's list, so I'll be quiet. Most people have concerns about narcotics. You know, the family members are all worried about addiction. Um, we worry, worry about delirium, and so I'm just throwing out there, pain causes delirium too. And yeah, if you can just make that leg comfortable and help get them through the night, great. Fentanyl IV, we don't use it very often except for a procedure. It's one of the cleanest on quick, off quick. Dilaudid also doesn't have very many breakdown products, so it again, is probably your best product if you need to use something. But when I say start low, go slow, I mean 0.25. You know, the time that it takes for uptake, 15 minutes, peak of action is soon after that, <coughs> 5 to 15. If you haven't got the pain under control at that point, you can give it again, particularly in a monitored setting, and you can keep using it. If you if the paramedics have been kind enough to send in the spouse with a giant Ziploc and Oxycontin, 60 milligrams BID is in that, well then you don't have an opiate naive patient. You have somebody whose pain needs are gonna be quite a bit higher. Um, and the specifics of that, they're nice charts that you can work through, but again with monitoring, give them some IV and work your way up. And I think that's everything and it's now Linda's turn.